The interface we're gonna start with today um, is the comparable interface. It's built into the Java standard library. It's super simple. It has exactly one method in it called compare to. It takes a single parameter, which is the object to which we're comparing this object. And it returns an integer value um, that is either less than zero, greater than zero, or equal to zero. We've seen this before. The string class implements the comparable interface. That's what the compare to method is on the string class. So we, we've called the compare to method before. Today we're going to write it ourselves. Um, so let's do that. Let's write, this will take just a moment. Let's write, let's implement an interface. Um, and that'll be a good way to wrap up today. So open up the coin class, which is already mostly written inside of your BlueJ project. And all it takes um, to implement an interface is to update our class header to specify that we're doing so. So we use the implements keyword. So when we're implementing an interface, it's implements. When we're subclassing another class, it's extends, but implements in this case. Comparable is the name of the interface. The comparable interface is a little bit unique in that we also need to tell it the type of the object we're comparing. Um, so it's a generic, like array list. So inside the angle brackets, we put the thing we're comparing. We want to be able to compare coins. This coin class models a coin that might be used, let's say, in a change dispenser, right? So we can create an object for a dime. We can create an object for a penny, an object for a quarter. It has a value. It's got a name. We've got some methods here like constructors and accessors, a two-string method, all that good stuff. Once we say implements comparable coin, we just made a promise. And the Java compiler is going to enforce that promise. And right now it's saying, wait a minute, you promised that this coin class implements the comparable interface. And yet you have not implemented the compare to method. You have to do it. You said you would. We're counting on you. So let's do it. Let's implement the compare to method. So I'm going to add this at the bottom of the file. And we'll say public int compare to. And it takes one parameter of type coin, which I'll call other, like the other object we're comparing. Um, and then we can implement this. So you, hopefully you remember from the string class, we're going to either return a value greater than zero, less than zero, or equal to zero. So we can say if this dot value, all we care about is the value of the coin, is greater than other dot value, return one. I just picked one arbitrarily. We could have returned 43. Doesn't matter as long as it's a value greater than zero. Else if this dot value is less than other dot value, return negative one. Again, negative one is arbitrary. It could be any negative integer. Could have returned negative 101. If it's not greater and it's not less than, they must be equal, so return zero. That's gotta be zero. Value is a private instance variable, uh, but we are inside the coin class. So not only can we directly reference value for this object, we can reference value for any other coin object, including the one referenced by the other parameter variable. The reason why compare to has this behavior where it just wants an integer greater than zero or less than zero is it lets us write some more flexible code. We could have we could replace all of this. This is easier to understand, but we could have replaced all of this with a single line of code that says something like this. We could subtract this dot value from other dot value, multiply it by 100, cast it to an int. If this dot value is greater than other dot value, that will always result in a positive integer. And if this dot value is less than other dot value, that will always result in a negative integer. So being able to write more efficient code like this is why compare to has the behavior it has. So we could replace the above code with this. But I'm going to leave it here in our notes, but comment it out so everything compiles.
That's all it takes to implement an interface. One method, not so bad. Okay. A good question is, why would we bother? Why don't we just write our own compare to method? Why do we bother with implements comparable? And that's what we'll focus on at the start of class tomorrow. We focused on the syntax of how to implement an interface yesterday. So the idea of using the implements reserved word, specifying the name of the interface, comparable as a generic. So in the angle brackets, we have to specify exactly what we're gonna be comparing. We're gonna be comparing coins. And then at the end of this class, we actually implemented our compare to method, um, which we're already familiar with from the string class, behaves in the same way. If two things are equal, we return zero. Um, otherwise, if this object is greater than the other object, we return a positive integer. If this object is less than the other object, we return a negative integer. So we implemented compare to. One very reasonable thing is like, why do we need the comparable interface, right? We could have just written a compare to method in our coin class on our own. Um, why would we bother with this whole implements comparable thing? Um, so that's what I wanna focus on first today. Understanding the usefulness of this um, is important. So go ahead and open up the coin test class, um, which is already written in our BlueJ project. Um, in the coin test class, we create a, a new coin that represents a quarter. We create another new coin that represents a dime. We create another new coin that represents a nickel. We create a new empty array list and we add the quarter, the dime and the nickel to that array list. Um, and then we can print that list out. Here is why implementing the comparable interface is actually useful. Um, if we uncomment the two lines of code that were commented out, this line of code here, collections.sort. Collections is a class that's part of the Java standard library. It has a static method called sort, and it can sort a list of anything as long as the elements in that list are comparable. This is the power of interfaces, right? If we implement the comparable interface, we can take advantage of all sorts of other methods that are already written that can interoperate with things that are comparable, even though they know nothing about our specific class. The sort methods of the collections class was written decades ago. We wrote the coin class yesterday, <laughs> and yet it works because we implement the interface. The sort method knows nothing about coins or strings or anything else that's comparable um, or person objects, which you'll be writing in a moment. Um, it just knows how to sort things that are comparable. It doesn't care what the specific type is. That's the power of, of interfaces. So when we actually run this code now, when I run this test comparable method, I can see that the initial order was quarter, dime, nickel, and now the order is from least to greatest, nickel, dime, quarter. Um, that's why implementing an interface is so much, um, so powerful, so powerful. Let me show you another example, just to kind of reiterate this point of like, why do we care about interfaces? Why are interfaces useful? Um, here's a very simple interface that I wrote as an example. Um, it is a uh, interface called measurable, okay? And this is in your BlueJ project as well. And the measurable interface simply has one method, get measure, and it returns a double. Okay. We use, you know, to reiterate this point from yesterday, we use interfaces when we have otherwise unrelated classes that still have a common behavior, right? There are many things we might want to be able to measure that otherwise have no connection to each other. Um, so here's, here's an example of that. Um, here's a bank account class. Okay, so we could have this bank account class implement the measurable interface because we want to be able to measure the bank account. And maybe the measure of a bank account is how much money is in the bank account. That could be one way we could do it. So we make our bank account measurable and, and the measure is how much money is in it. Another class that we might want to make measurable is a country. There is no connection between a country and a bank account. Um, but they both have a shared behavior in that like, we'd like to be able to measure them. 
So we could say the country implements the measurable interface as well. And perhaps we decide that the measure of a country is its area, okay? How many square miles the country is, right? So even though country and bank account have nothing really in common, they still have a shared behavior in that we want to be able to measure them. And the value of that is then we could write a class like this class data. And this class data knows nothing about countries and knows nothing about bank accounts, but simply has a static method similar to the sort method of the collections class that takes an array of objects that are measurable. So that could be an array of countries, that could be an array of bank accounts. It doesn't care, it doesn't know anything about the specific class, it just knows that, hey, if you give me an array of any object, as long as that object implements the measurable interface, I know I can operate on it. I know I can write a little enhanced for loop that goes through every object in that array. I can call the get measure method on that object because it implements the measurable interface. I know I can call get measure and it will return a double. And I can sum that up and I can find the average and I can return that. And if we look at the BlueJ project window, we can even see here's the data class. The data class depends upon, this is this little arrow here, the measurable interface, but there is no connection between the data class and country or the data class and bank account, right? Um, that's the power of the interface, right? We could write a third class, um, turtle, and we could decide to make turtles measurable. I don't know what we'd measure them based on, but whatever. Um, and that would still work with the data class without even having to recompile anything. Um, and so this measurable tester just gives you an example of like why this is useful in terms of creating, let's create an array of bank account objects, but they're all measurable. Um, and we can pass them to the average method of the data class. Um, let's create another array of countries. And we, the syntax is, is exactly the same. We can call the average method of the data class and pass in the array of countries, and it returns the average area. Okay. Um, so we can write code like the average method of this data class that we can then leverage for all sorts of different types of classes that otherwise have no relationship because they implement the same interface. Um, and that's the power of interface. That's the why. Why do we care about interfaces? Why do we use interfaces? Because it enables stuff like this. Um, that's a huge advantage that we're going for here. To help tie this a little bit together before we move on, I did want to also just help and connect and share this, that there's a couple Java standard library interfaces that we've now been using, um, and there's more to come later this week. But um, yesterday we focused on the comparable interface. Honestly, that wasn't the first time that we've been using the comparable interface. The string class implements the comparable interface. That's why the string class has a compare to method. Um, so we've been calling the compare to method last semester. Um, and, this, and what we were really doing is calling the compare to method in the string class that exists because the string class implements the comparable interface. Another example of an interface that we've been using um, without necessarily realizing it is the list interface. The array list class that we studied in our previous unit um, implements the list interface. Um, the reason why there's a list interface is that a list is a concept, has a certain set of behaviors, um, but there are multiple ways to implement a list. In the context of this class, we just care about array lists, but in software engineering, we study like linked lists. So the linked list class also implements the list interface. Um, so array lists and linked lists implement the same interface, um, but have very different implementations. Um, and the pros and cons of that is something we study in, in software engineering. Uh, but there's also the list interface that you may see. Later this week, we're gonna see that there is several interfaces that are used um, to implement different types of design patterns. Design patterns are 
are common ways of solving problems that pop up over and over again in object-oriented programming. One of those is basically called the observer or the listener pattern. And it's the idea that when something happens, I want one of my methods to be called. Okay? This is at the very heart of doing graphical user interfaces, which is where we're headed later this week. When someone clicks this button, I want this method to be called. When someone chooses this menu item, I want this method to be called. When someone clicks and drags a mouse within this window, I want this method to be called. All of that is built around interfaces as well. So we'll be studying listeners um, later this week, tomorrow probably. We'll start looking at that. So I just wanted to connect this so that you're aware of, of um, these interfaces that are part of the Java standard library um, that have been hiding in the background, that now we have a better understanding of the, the role they play.